Christmas. So John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And this evening at sundown, Jews all over the world are going to celebrate Hanukkah. I bet you never heard a sermon about Hanukkah preached before in a church. Well, I've never preached this before, and I'm going to preach it. And, and what I'm going to show you goes along with everything that's, that's been done and everything that's, that's been said. That's how the, Lord, how the Lord works. But it's a celebration. Hanukkah is a celebration for eight days. From sundown uh, this evening to sundown the 26th of December is the celebration of Hanukkah. Hanukkah. I know most Christians say, well, I don't, I don't celebrate Hanukkah. I celebrate the birth of Christ. I celebrate Christmas. Well, well I do too, okay? But, but I'm going to show you some lessons today, some lessons from the story of Hanukkah, lessons that we can take from it. So, you know, mo most people, when they think of Hanukkah, they just think of, of it being like a, the Jewish version of Christmas, you know? <laughs> you give gifts. You know, Christmas, we give gifts one day. You know, Jewish people, they give eight days, eight days of Christmas. Some of you kids want to convert to a Jew right now, don't you? So you get eight days of, of presents, eight days of, of gifts. Um, they eat a lot of food, just like, and I'm going to show you some of the traditions. They eat a lot of food. They light candles. We light candles. They, we have red and green lights. Well, you see blue and white lights from our Jewish friends. And, uh, you know, uh, I, when, when I was, well, when I was a teenager, well, in the, well, early 90s, I was a teenager, but I, be, I didn't really even know much about Hanukkah until I watched Saturday Night Live and saw Adam Sandler sing the Hanukkah song. And I'm like, wow, the Hanukkah song. You ever heard the Hanukkah song? Look at John chapter 10, verse 22. It says, now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. Verse 23, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So it says that Jesus, he was at the feast of dedication. Dedication. Most people don't pay attention to this. But the word dedication in ancient Hebrew is the word Hanukkah. In modern English, in, in modern Hebrew, it's Hanukkah. So Jesus was at the feast of Hanukkah. He celebrated the feast of Hanukkah, the feast of dedication. And when you look into the background, I'm going to show you some things today. You can see, I'm going to show you that, that Hanukkah, there's so many prophetic, prophetic uh, points and symbolism that point to Jesus. So what are some of the traditions of Hanukkah? Well, you, you celebrate, and, and like I mentioned, you give gifts for eight days. Unlike Passover and, and, and some of the other Jewish holy days that require a fast Hanukkah is a celebration there is no fast and of course that's what Christians are good at that where we can eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat especially this church right here you eat every day you eat lots of lots of foods now check this out specifically a tradition is to eat lots of foods fried in oil now you southern soul food cookers now you can really dig this can't you Fried foods, fried oil, uh, uh, latkes, or fried p potato pancakes, which is a Jewish tradition. Look up the recipe for Jewish latkes that are they're fried in the oil. Homemade donuts, fried in oil. So there's lots of eating. There's lots of celebration. That lots of games are played. And uh, I got a little, little, some little things here. And one of the most, what, what can y'all guess one of the most popular games to play at Hanukkah is? Dreidel. Somebody sing the dreidel song. You're really good. I'll tell you. You're really good. Dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. I made it out of something. But I don't know. You're, but anyways, I got some dreidels. And, and the way you play this game, and we're not going to play right now. But the way you play it is every side, there's a Hebrew alphabet. So you put money in the pot and you spin the dreidel and whichever side it lands on, you got whether you put more money in or whether you get to take the pot. 
And so it's a neat little, it's a neat little game to play. You put like pennies in the, the pot as well. So the dreidel game. There's a, another, another tradition at Hanukkah is kids are given, these are chocolate, chocolate coins, and they're wrapped in gold. This is called gelt. Gelt is Yiddish for money, okay? And so this is a tradition. This is actually chocolate in, in these, these, metal, these, these metal foil. And it's a, it's a tradition for, of rabbis back in the... We're going to look at the story of Hanukkah. But after the victory of Hanukkah, rabbis would give out a gold coin to the poor in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, to the widows, to the orphans. And so today... You can, you can buy these at your, at your local store. And, and actually, I'm going I'm to give you one. All right, and I'm going to give you one to give to Angel, okay? I'm going to give you, here, give this, give that to Ashley to give to Angel. It's a gold, gold coin from Rabbi Ray, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and this is kosher. This is kosher, okay? It's non-dairy, so I don't even know. I've got another one here. Uh, Katie, give it to Dakota, all right? All right, it's on the seat, all right. So, so what's all of this about? What are, what are they celebrating? And of course, I'm going to pull this up in a second, but it's all centered around this nine-candled uh, menorah. So what is all the celebration about? Well, the story of Hanukkah, it's not in the Bible itself, but it's recorded in ancient Jewish manuscripts, Jewish writings. But here's the story. In 186 BC, before Christ, Antiochus IV Epiphanes of the Greeks, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a faction of, of the Greek Syrians, okay? He invaded Jerusalem with his army. He came into Jerusalem. He massacred thousands of Jews. He took over the city. He took over the temple. He outlawed Judaism. He outlawed the worship of Jehovah God. And this is in the city of God. This is in the city of God. The temple, the holy temple, the second, te the rebuilt temple. Remember the first temple, Solomon's temple was destroyed in 586 BC by the Babylonians. And, and a new temple was rebuilt. So he comes in and, and he takes over this temple and, and he outlaws the worship of Jehovah. And he set up Greek gods around the city to worship. And you know the Greek, all the ancient Greek mythological gods uh, that, that they worshipped. And he went into the temple and he desecrated the temple. He defiled the temple, the holy temple of God. He defiled it. He went into the holy place and, and destroyed the altar, the altar where the sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb, the blood and... and Excuse me, and all of that was, was taken before the Lord. He, he defiled it. He desecrated the altar. He built an altar to Zeus, the god Zeus. And he even went so far as to sacrifice pigs, which we know that is the most unholy of animals to the Jewish people. So he is spitting in God's face. He's spitting on Judaism. He, he's defiling. This is defiance against God. It's the desecration of the holy sanctuary of God. So it was a horrible time in Jerusalem. But in the midst of this Greek occupation, there was a righteous Jewish priest named Mattathias Maccabee. And this righteous priest said, enough's enough. He, he rose up with holy indignation. He, he, he rose up just furious. He, he, refused, he refused to allow the temple to be desecrated any further. No more defiling the temple. He, he's, he was determined. He's going to bring the people back to worship the one true God. And so he led a revolt Against, Antioch, against Antiochus IV. He led a revolt with his five sons. And he put a little army together, a small army together, and he revolted against this Greek invasion. The revolt would last a, a couple years, and Mattathias the priest died. 
but his son Judah Maccabee took over. Maybe you've heard the, 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 the Maccabees, heard of the Maccabees. Judah Maccabee took over the rebellion, and though they were outnumbered, they were outmanned, they were inferior to, to the Greek army, to, to Antiochus, they would end up defeating the Greeks, and they drove them out of Jerusalem, and they took back the temple for the Lord. And they were called the Maccabee rebels. So maybe you're wondering, this is, well, this is a good story. Why isn't this story in the Bible? This is, this is it's a Bible story. You know, this goes along with some of the, the ancient biblical stories of where, where, where the, the, the Israelites were outnumbered, but God came through. Well, this story took place in the 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The 400 years between the, the two testaments is known by scholars, biblical scholars, as the silent years. The time where there was no prophet speaking. Remember the voice of the Lord in the Old Testament was through the prophet, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of the, diff all of the different prophets. So that period of time between the last prophet of the Old Testament and the first prophet of the New Testament, which is John the Baptist, by the way, the first 400 years, it's known as the silent years years. But here's what's so amazing about this story. And, and, and I'm going to give you four lessons that we as Christians can learn from Hanukkah. Because Hanukkah shows us that even in the silent years, even in, the, even in those, that, that season of time when, when the prophetic voice is not being uttered, when it seems that God is, is not speaking, Hanukkah shows us that even in the silence, God still works. God still moves and he works and he fights for his righteous people, people that are, that'll stand up and take a stand for God. And here's my four points here. Number one, the first point, God works in the silence. Even in the silent years, no prophet that we know of that's recorded in the canon of Scripture the, the, the voice of God, where is, where is God? Well, I'll tell you where he is in the silence. He's working behind the scenes. The application for us is I think we've all had seasons of life where it seems God is silent. Where's God? Have you had those seasons of life where you're trying to get clarity, you're trying to get direction? It, it, it's like, where is God? You can't sense his presence. You can't sense his spirit. Where, where, where is he? Why, 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 why can't I hear from God? But see, this story lets us know that even when God seems silent, he hasn't stopped working for his people. Isaiah 64 verse 4 says, For since the world began, no ear has heard, no eye has seen a God like you. And I love this next phrase. Who works for those who wait or trust in him. Who works for those who wait for him. We might not be able to hear him, but we need to know that God is still working for those who wait for him. For him, we might not be able to see him, but we need to know that God is still working for those who wait for him. Aren't you glad of that? Here's an important point to understand when God is silent. When God is silent, you can bet your bottom dollar. <laughs> when God is silent, his word is still speaking. When God is silent, his word still speaks. That word you got in your hands. When God is silent, his word still stands. And even in the silence, we might not be able to hear him in our spirit or we might not be able to, to, to get clarity or direction, but even in the silent, we can stand on his promises. We can stand on what he's already said because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what he has already said will, will go millions of years into the future. We can stand on that promise. Isaiah 41, verse 10, Fear not, for I am with you. This is a promise that God gave the Israelites through Isaiah. Now, Isaiah is writing this, is speaking this to the Israelites before the Babylonian invasion. So this is, this is about 300 years prior. A, a, a tough time was going to come to Jerusalem. A tough time is going to come to Israel. And, and he says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. 
for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What a promise he's given to his people. This is the, this is the prophetic word. This is the written word. And Mattathias and Judah Maccabee, they, they had to have stand, had, had to have stood on this word right here. They had to have stood. They, they, there might not have been a, a prophet in the day, but they had the writings of God. They had the prophets. They had the, the writings, the, the Psalms. They had the Torah. And they stood on God's word. They trusted that God would strengthen them against this great army. Army. They trusted that God would help them and deliver them, as it says, with my righteous right hand. And by standing on God's word, they were able to stand against the Greek invasion. What a story here. And when God is silent, I want you to understand this. When God is silent, you might be in that silent season. But I promise you, even if it seems God is silent... His word is still speaking to you. His word still stands. You can trust his word. He might be silent, but he's never left us. He might be silent, but he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He might be silent, but you can, you, I can, pro he might be silent, but he, behind the scenes, he's still working all things out for you. See, I believe Romans 8, 28. You believe that? Uh, we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God. How many of you love God this morning? He might be silent, but he's right now, he's working all things to your good. Somebody give him praise. Give him a prayer, a clap offering or something. You might be in a silent season right now. You might be in a season where you can't find clarity, where you feel alone, where you feel confused. But even though he might be silent, his word is still speaking. His word remains the same. He's exalted his name. He's exalted his word even above his name. That's what the psalmist said. And if you'll stand on his word, if you'll stand on the promises of his word, you'll be able to stand against anything that comes your way. Like that old hymn, I'm standing on the promises of God. If you stand on his word, you'll be able to stand against the attack of the enemy. You'll be able to stand uh, against the devil and all his minions because God still works in the silence. Here's the second principle. Number two, God restores in the desecration. Not the destruction. Of course, we know God destroys in the destruction, but in the context, he, des he restores in the desecration. Because the Jewish temple was desecrated by the Greeks. It was defiled. It wasn't completely destroyed like the first, like Solomon's temple, the Babylonians. It was defiled. It was desecrated. Meaning the holy temple became unholy because of what the Greeks brought into God's house. They sinful man pushed out the holy things of God, so it became defiled, desecrated, became a place of idolatry, became a place of unclean sacrifices. And one of the first things that Judah Maccabee and his and his rebel forces did was they they went into the temple and they cleansed the temple. They they rid the temple of the idolatry. They, they cleaned up the house of God. They did house cleaning in the house of God. I think there, there's, there's a lot of churches right now that need some house cleaning. The church, the, 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 the holy place, he went in and he, he cleansed the temple. He, he got rid of the idols. He got rid of the, the Greek influence. And he restored it, the temple, to the place of holiness it was called to be. He, he restored the temple to the worship of the one true God. And, and God would honor his obedience. God would honor what, what he did to restore, what, what Judah did to, to restore the Lord's house. And, and God, when, when Judah restored the, the temple to its proper place, God restored his presence there. See, God's presence left when the Greeks defiled it. But God's presence came back to the temple. And here's the lesson. Here's the lesson here for us. Because I think of 1 Corinthians 3.16, which says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God 
dwells in you. What did Judah do? He restored the desecrated temple. He cleansed the desecrated temple. And see, as Christians, we're the temple of God. In this new covenant, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're the temple. We're, we're the carriers of God's presence. That's, that's, a, that's another amazing thing that, that I just can't get over. The, the old covenant, God dwelt in a place. The new covenant, woo, God dwells in a person. He dwells in me. He dwells in you and you and you. But see, we're the temple. But, but, but here, here's the problem with our temple. Our temple is defiled. You don't, you're, you're, you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're born a sinner. See, progressive theology says, oh, we're all born good. No, we're all born bad, defiled, right? Corrupted by sin. Paul says, there's no good thing that dwells in me. So our temple is defiled. We're all guilty of defiling and desecrating our temple. We're all guilty of, of sin. But Hanukkah tells us that if we cleanse our temple, if we go to the Lord, if we go to the throne of grace to receive mercy and grace, if we, if we repent before the Lord, if we confess our, our, our sin before the Lord, He'll cleanse us. He'll cleanse us. He'll wash us clean and restore. He'll wash us in the blood of Jesus and He'll restore us in our desecration. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible because this verse I probably need more than any other verse in the Bible if we confess our sins. You know, if you look at verse 8, it says, My little children, I write that you sin not. Well, there ain't no way that I can sin not. <laughs> but I love it says, But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse our temple from all unrighteousness because God restores in the desecrated, aren't you thankful for a God that restores in the midst of our desecration, our old defiled temple? And, and I, I, I promise you, look, look as, as, as Christians, we don't practice sinning. Sin should, we should not be comfortable in our sin. But the fact is, we do sin. We do fall. We do, we do fail. But, but the good news is, is, if we go to God, he will come to us and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Aren't, aren't you thankful for his forgiveness, for his mercy? Here's the third lesson from Hanukkah. Number three, God lights up the darkness. He lights up. I was going to add continually in front of lights up, but let's, I just say he lights and he keeps it lit. <laughs> he lights up the darkness. Besides the, the miracle of the victory of Hanukkah, there was another amazing miracle that, that took place. Besides the amazing miracle of Judah and, and this outmanned army running off the Greeks, another great miracle took place. And here's the miracle. As Judah and his men were restoring the temple, cleansing the temple, they found the large golden menorah that continually burned in the temple. They found that menorah they cleaned it and cleansed the menorah, and they returned it to its proper place. And as they were lighting it, though, the problem was the oil used to light the candles had been profaned by the Greeks. Let me explain this. The, the temple menorah, it wasn't just candles. It was lamps that burned from the oil. Okay, It was an oil lamp, an oil lamp menorah. And, of course, we know that oil... The, the oil is what causes the, the lamps, the candles to burn. But here's the deal. You can't just get any oil, just any old oil, and fill up the menorah. That's a violation of Jewish law, of God's law. It, the oil, it was a process to create and make and prepare the oil for the temple menorah. Only the priests could prepare the oil just like only the high priest could go into the holy of holies one time a year only the priest could prepare the holy oil same with the holy anointing oil only the priest and so what happened was that there was they only found one container of oil that wasn't 
desecrated. See, the priest would, it would take a week to prepare the oil, and the high priest himself had to prepare it and seal the oil in a container. And they only found one container of oil that was sealed by the priest. All the others were defiled. The, the Greeks had gotten in and, and, and desecrated the, the, other, the other containers of oil. But because Judah Maccabee was so obedient to restore the temple, to fight what's, for what was right, he was so obedient not to use the desecrated oil because, see, a lot of times we as Christians, we'll, we'll compromise a little bit and, and God might say that's unholy. We'll dabble in the unholy thinking somehow we can turn the unholy into holy. And see, that's what so many of us do so often. But Judah says, I'm not going to take this unholy oil and present it before the Lord. So all he had was that one container of oil and he put that one container of oil in the, in the manure. And each container, it would only keep the candle lit for one day. But here's the miracle. One container of oil. Because Judah was so obedient, that one container of oil miraculously burned for eight days. After day one, it's burning again. After day two, it's burning again. How long did it take to prepare the holy oil? It took a week. So God kept that. I got chills. <laughs> God kept what, what should have only lasted one day. He miraculously caused it to last a whole week because of obedience to not defiling that manure with the unholy oil. What a miracle. See, that's why they give gifts for eight days because the miracle of the oil that kept burning. That's why the custom is to eat foods and, and oil. You know, Christians, we need some traditions like this, don't we? Fry, I mean, fry. Hey, who says we can't do this? It's why they light the menorah. I'm going to show that menorah. It's why they light the, light the menorah eight days because of the miracle of oil. And here's the lesson here for us. The lesson for us is that God will continuously light up our darkness God will continuously be our light when we walk in obedience, when we restore what's been desecrated, when we do things God's way, His way, when we don't dabble in the unholy. See, oil represents the Holy Spirit too, doesn't it? When we constantly seek His presence, when we constantly seek His power, He'll continuously fill us with light and life and fill us with the power of his spirit. Think about this. Think about this miracle. God took what was not enough. There's not enough right there. He took what was not enough, honored their obedience, and turned their not enough into more than enough. Come on, somebody shout at that. All they had was a little bit of oil. This reminds me of the widow in 2 Kings, the widow in Elisha. All she had was just a little bit of oil. You remember that story where go get the containers and keep pouring? As long as you find an empty vessel, I'll keep pouring the oil. All they had was just a little bit of oil for one day. They didn't have enough. It was not enough. But through an act of obedience, God multiplied the oil and turned their not enough into more than enough. Maybe you're in a silent season right now where you can't sense God's direction. Maybe you're in a not enough season, a silent not enough season where what you have is not enough to do what you think you need to do. Not enough strength. God, I think you're calling me to do this, but, but I, I don't have enough strength. God, I think you want me to, to, to do this, but I don't have enough confidence. I don't have enough courage. God, I think you, maybe, maybe somebody's being called into ministry. Let me tell you, God calls those who are not enough. Let me just tell you, that's how God works. He calls the not enough. Maybe you're in a not enough season, not enough resources. Even financially, not enough finances to, to do what I need to do. Not enough, not enough wisdom. 
But if you take your not enough, instead of complaining about what you don't have, take what you do have, become obedient with what you do have, say, God, I don't have enough, but I'm giving it to you, and I'm trusting that miraculously you're going to turn my not enough into more than enough for your glory. That's the miracle of Hanukkah. Another name for Hanukkah is the Festival of Lights. And I got this here, and I want to show you. It's called the Festival of Lights. And I got a nine-candled menorah here. As I mentioned, Hanukkah is centered around the menorah. You know, a typical menorah has how many branches on a typical Jewish menorah? Seven. It's nine candles instead of seven like the normal one. So let's, so what about Jesus? Because I've titled this message, Jesus and Hanukkah. What about Jesus and Hanukkah? John 10, 23. It was Hanukkah, Feast of Dedication. And it says that Jesus, 10, 23, we just read it earlier. He walked into the temple. Now, verse 24, I saw something in verse 24 I have never seen in my life. It, it's like it just, it just hit me in the face. Y'all like that when, the, when you see something you've never seen? It's like the, the word just hits you in the face. And it's like, whoa. That's, that, that's when the logos, the written word, becomes a rhema word. And it stands out. And, man, it's right in, right in you. And I saw something. Because here, this might not mean anything to you right now, but it will in a second. But, but John 10, 24, it says he walked in the temple. John 10, 24 says, then the Jews surrounded him at Hanukkah, at the Feast of Dedication. The festival of lights. The Jews surrounded him. Jesus was in the center. Jesus was in the middle, and the Jews surrounded him. So let's look at the menorah. Eight candles on this side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Each candle represents the day of the miracle, the day of the, the miracle of oil. So every day you light the candle then you light another candle the next day but but actually what you do is you light one candle the first the second day you light two third day you light three fourth day you light four and so each new candle is lit but then notice right in the middle there's another candle and this candle always in the middle it sits higher than the rest it's 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 elevated above the rest now check this out this candle, this is called in Hebrew the Shamash candle. And for those that are taking notes, and I've, I've, you've got notes there. I'm, that's why I've, I prepare these notes so you can take notes every week. This is called the Shamash, S-H-A-M-A-S, H-M-A, wait, S-H-A, Sha, and then Mash, M-A-S-H, Sha, Mash candle. And the Shamash candle is what is used to light the other candles. See, here's the thing. You, I can't just take the lighter and light the candles. I have to light, and let me go ahead and light. I light the shamash candle, and I have to use the shamash candle to light the other candles. Now, check this out. Shamash. Shamash is Hebrew. In English, shamash means servant. The shamash candle to English-speaking Jews would call it the servant candle. Shamash, servant. So you think about this. This middle candle, the shamash candle, is the servant candle. The servant candle, the light of the servant candle is what lights the other candles that are surrounding the servant candle, the shamash candle. The, the servant candle which is in the middle of the other candles is what distributes and lights the flame of the candles that are surrounding the Shema. Do y'all see this? So, so I'll take this, and this is a little one here. So I'm taking the Shamash, the servant, and I'm lighting that first day the light of the servant, the Shamash. Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Shamash. And give his life as a ransom for many. 
John 1 verse 4, in him, Jesus, or in Shamash, in him was life. And the life, life, was the light of men. John 8 verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Notice how light and life are correlated. They're one and the same. Light is life. Life is light. So, so, so the light, the light represents the life of Jesus. That's what he's saying. The light represents the life of our Shamash. And it's his light that brings light and life to our life. It's his light. It's his life that brings light and life to our light. To our life. It's his light and his life that, that brings, you know, the Bible says we walk in newness of life. That brings newness of life. It's his light, the, the light of the servant, the, the light of the, see, see so many, so many religious people said, I've got to be the one to get to, Je oh, it's about what I can do for, Je I got to do this before I can get, no, Jesus, he came to serve you. He said, I'm giving you my light. I'm giving you my life. That's what brings joy, joy to my life. When I allow Shamash to, to light up my life. His light, his life brings hope to my life. His light, his life brings peace to my life. His light, his life brings healing to my broken life. His light and life fills every part of my life. You know, I love Colossians. Colossians says he, he is all in all and he fills all in all with his life. With his light. So how do we keep our and how do we keep our, our our lights blazing? How do we keep how do we keep the the his powerful life and, and being filled with his light and, and filled with, with his life? How do how do we keep this same flame burning and burning? We we just we just put Shamash Jesus right in the center of our life. We put Jesus right where he needs to be. We put Jesus at the exalted place in our life, above everyone else, above everything else. You know, I hear people saying, put Jesus first. No, Jesus needs to be first, second, third, fourth. It's alpha to omega. Here, Jesus needs to be at the center of your life because if you say he's just first, that means I can just come in on Sunday morning and forget about him the rest of the week. I can come in on the first day of the week, forget, but he has to remain at the center you want to stay full of life, full of light, full of joy, newness of life, hope, peace, healing, restoration. John 10, Jesus said, I've come to give you life, and, but life more abundantly. Isn't that amazing right there? Give God praise. Give, give our Shamash praise. Our Shamash. The one who came from heaven. That, that one that Philippians, Philippians says that he had to descend. Looking unto Jesus. Look, he, he descended. He, he went low. The, the, the exalted one left heaven and became a servant so that we can be filled with his light. I'm going to burn this blow this out. I don't want to set the church on fire, so let me, and I was told I need to blow down. See, this is what the devil does, right? He comes to try to blow out the light. And don't you call me a devil. I'm just demonstrating that's what the devil does. Here's my last point, and Lindsay somewhere, oh, there's Lindsay. All right. Hello, Lindsay. Glad you could join us today. Here's my last point. In lieu of the miracle of the victory, in lieu of the victory that God provided to a bunch of ragamuffins, in lieu of the, the God restoring the temple, 
in lieu of the miracle of oil, in lieu of, of God d- d- providing what was not enough and, and, and creating more, in lieu of all of that. Well, here's what Hanukkah is all about. Hanukkah means dedication. In lieu of everything that God has done for you, God is worthy of our dedication. He's worthy of our service. He came to serve me. Oh, he's worthy of our service, isn't he? God's worthy of our dedication. See, Hanukkah is the feast of dedication. Remembering the, when the, the Maccabees, they dedicated themselves. They dedicated the new temple back to God, giving thanks for his victory and for his mighty miracles. And, and I'm not going to get into it right now, but every day there's a, a blessing that every family is to proclaim, a Jewish blessing every time they light a candle. Blessings such as, oh, blessed be the God, blessed be our God who, who has provided for us, blessed be our God who has miraculously done this. Who, and so you can look up these blessings, the Hanukkah blessings. And every day when they light these candles, they, they quote uh, Psalms 113 to 118 which are called the halal psalms they're just songs of praise so so they're lighting these can- and we know this is all about jesus don't we so we even we got i mean we're we're and we can read the psalms and thank god for his for his mighty works here's here's what i think one last verse dedication 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 romans 12 verse 1 therefore i urge you brothers and sisters in view of god's mercy in view of his grace in view of him restoring and forgiving your defiled temple, in, in view of, of, of how he provides, in view of his strength and power and honoring his word, in view of all of that, I'm urging you to dedicate yourself as a living sacrifice to the Lord. Dedicating myself as a sacrifice, my body, my life as a sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. So happy Hanukkah. You know, who, sa- who says we can't celebrate this and celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ? Who, who says it has to be one or the other? Because this points to the light of the world that was born. This points to the light of the world that, that came and, and gave his life as a ransom for many. I want to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. And maybe you're watching online, maybe you're in here today, and and you've never received Jesus, our Shamash, as your Lord and your Savior. That's the gospel. The gospel is not about what you can do for Christ, hoping to get in good graces with Christ. The gospel is what God in Christ has done for you. We receive, He served us, He's our Shamash. We, we can't earn our salvation. You gotta, we can't earn our salvation. All of our best is not good enough. But today, this December day and this Sunday, would you give your life to Christ? I'm giving you the, the opportunity right now. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Would you pray with me? This is just a template. Now, you got you to pray this from your heart. <laughs> but I'm going to just lead you in a prayer. Just say, Jesus, I know that you came for me. Just from your heart. Jesus, I know you came for me. You came as my shamash. You came. Jesus, you gave your life for me. Pray that if you, you want to receive. Oh, he'll fill up your life. Maybe you came in today with, with no light. You came in today, no hope, no joy, no peace. Receive the light into your life. Jesus, you are my shamash who went to the cross and died for me. With the heart you believe, with the mouth confession is made. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Jesus, I know that I cannot save myself. Just confess, I know I can't save myself. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. I'm asking you to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I'm asking you to be my Savior. And I come into my life. I'm asking you to come into my life. Forgive me. Cleanse me. If you pray a prayer just from your heart, He will save you. He will fill you with His, with his light his light maybe you're here today as your heads are bowed your eyes are closed you're meditating on the word you're reflecting and maybe you're here today and maybe you're a believer maybe you're a christian but 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 your light is just a flicker right now your lamp is low on oil right now and i bet there's people watching i bet there's people that are in here today you're you're just running on a little bit of oil there's just just a there's just a flicker 
you're burnt out, you're beat up, disgusted. Maybe you're in a, a position of, of a silent, you're in a silent season. And, and I talked to somebody this past week that says, I've, just, I've been begging God, God, please help me, please give me direction. I've been begging God, quote, I've been begging God for a sign because I can't get any clarity, I can't get any, maybe you're in that silent season right now. I want to pray for you, I want to pray for you. I, I want to believe that God's going to bring that logos, which is the written word, to your heart and, and faith is going to arise and you're going to stand on his word because that's what you got to understand. It, it, it hap we all go through silent seasons. In the silent season is when we need to take hold of the word, the written word of God in the side that's when we've got to stand doing all but to stand and if, if you need prayer right now if nobody's looking around I want you to slip up your hand I want to pray I'm in a silent season a not enough season I, I need the word of God to, to stand upon Father, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, I, I, I pray in Jesus' name. Those that have their hands lifted, I'm sure if, if they're not watching live, they're going to be watching down the road and, and they're in a not enough season. They're in a silent season. Father, I pray that, that the word of God that we have would come alive. We don't need to look for signs. We don't need to look for this. We can just stand on what we already have and, and trust that you are good. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. See, when you're standing on the word of God, you don't need a sign. You don't have to have God's all you got to do is stand on the word take a step he'll direct your step and I pray that over you right now you might not even know where you're stepping I pro if you're stepping on a word just step out on I promise you he will direct your paths he will this is how this works this is how this works we, we J Jesus told the he says a wicked generation seeks signs you know what he's saying a faithless generation seeks signs we're no longer faithless we're faithful Field. We walk by faith, not by sight. We have his word. Take what you do have. It might not be much, but take what you do have. Give it to the Lord and let him multiply just like he did the loaves and the fishes. And I'm praying that for you. I'm praying that for you. I've seen this over and over again. How God brings the not enough into more than enough and I'm just believing that that's going to be your next season the season of not enough you're about to step into a season of more than enough because you're going to walk by faith and not by sight and so Father we do it now do it now in Jesus name Amen Amen